Okay, so I recently beat Elden Ring's DLC twice. My first playthrough I used the Dryleaf Arts hand-to-hand -hand weapon, and the second playthrough I used only incantations. Now for my first playthrough I didn't look up what I felt were important things like where items were and how to do NPC quests. I looked up how to get to one area which was the hinterlands and everything else I discovered myself. Now the character I went into the DLC with for my first playthrough was the one I made with the goal of getting to the DLC as quickly as I could, which took me 2 hours and 50 minutes. So with my character being low level when entering the DLC, I struggled significantly more than was necessary, and my damage was also incredibly bad. And because of that, I don't feel like I was able to use the hand-to-hand -hand weapon to its full potential. So I'm probably going to do another playthrough with them at some point because the weapon felt incredibly underwhelming in terms of damage. The only time that wasn't the case was when I was using a no-hit setup and my second playthrough couldn't have been more different in terms of how fights went. My second playthrough, I destroyed bosses easily. Obviously, I know the boss movesets better than my first playthrough, but even still, the damage I was doing was absurd. And that was without Red Feather or Ritual Sword Talisman. Knight's Lightning Spear is probably the best general use incantation in Elden Ring, because there are incantations that do more damage, but they just aren't practical. The only other incantation that competes with it is Multi-Layered Ring of Light, and you don't need to fight any bosses in order to go and get these incantations, you can just go and get them as soon as you enter the DLC. And they've trivialized pretty much every fight I've done so far, which is all except some side bosses. There were only three bosses that took me a while, and by a while I mean more than a minute or two, those being Midra, Mesmer, and the final boss. Mesmer took a while because I wanted to try no-hitting him again with incantations only, and I got close a few times, but my patience ran out, so I stopped trying, and obviously because I was trying to no-hit the fight, I played it very safe. Midra took a while again for the same reason, I was playing it very safe because even though I wasn't trying to no-hit the fight, with the build I was using, I would still die very quickly, so obviously I wanted to avoid taking hits. The final boss took the longest at 5 minutes, because the final boss is just a terribly designed fight, which sucks almost no matter what you use, unless you're using a setup to one-shot the boss with one of the bug weapons, or using one of the busted spells. In that case, the boss is easy, but otherwise, it's a terrible fight. Now, the character I went into the DLC with after my first playthrough was a faith character at 120, with almost every incantation in the game, and pretty much all the items you'd need for an incantation-only build, because I set up that character to do incantation-only duels. As soon as I got into the DLC, I went and grabbed Knight's Lightning Spear almost immediately, and I also fought Bale pretty early on so I could get the Priestess Heart, which buffs Knight's Lightning Spear. And I actually enjoyed the fight with Bale this time around, because I was actually able to see the boss and do good damage. My first playthrough, I didn't enjoy the fight at all. I found it incredibly hard to hit him, and because you have to be so close with the hand-to-hand -hand weapon, you can't see Bale very well because his head is only slightly higher off the ground than where his feet are, and he's really wide, and his shoulders are really high above him. So if you lock onto Bale and you're standing right in his face, you can't see his shoulders, which is a problem because he attacks with his arms. And it was just really frustrating. This time around, I just spammed Bale with Lightning Spears, and Egon ended up killing Bale after I died, so I didn't end up having to redo the fight. But even if I was by myself, I don't think it would have changed much. Another reason my Lightning Spear is so good is because a lot of DLC bosses are standing in water, which lowers their lightning resistance and causes an additional instance of minor damage in a small AoE when hit by lightning attacks. So for those bosses in particular, Knight's Lightning Spear just melts them, and Multi-Layered Ring of Light is incredibly strong against the undead. You can combine the Last Rite's Ash of War and Sacred Order for a massive boost to holy damage. That's what I did for Putrescent Knight, and it was hardly a fight. I'm kind of glad that my build wasn't as good for my first playthrough, because it really helped me learn more of the boss's movesets, but on the flip side, it also made some bosses unbearably awful, like the final boss and Bale. 
while this is still fresh in my mind, I just want to say that most of the Remembrance bosses have some really awful moves. The amount of moves in the DLC that require you to run away in order to avoid them is absurd, especially the ones that have an active area of effect around the boss. That to me is awful design. And unfortunately, the final boss is the pinnacle of a terribly designed fight. I think visually, the final boss looks really cool, and thematically, it's a rehashing of a fight from Dark Souls 3, but it's just an awful fight. I no-hit Mesmer during my first playthrough of the DLC. It took me 10 hours to do, but I did it because I was having so much fun with the fight that I wanted to keep doing it and getting better. After I beat Mesmer, I looked at what other people did to avoid his moves and saw a bunch of different methods for dodging his attacks, some being significantly better ways of avoiding his moves than what I personally came up with. To me, that's the sign of a well-designed boss. And because of that, Mesmer is my favorite boss in Elden Ring in general, not just the DLC, even though he does have some, well, one bullshit move. I just think he needs to do his double slash way more often. It's such a rare move that I've only ever seen him do it a few times. I can honestly say I only remember seeing him do it twice because he has a double slash that he uses to reposition and that move is really common, but he also has a stationary double slash which he can follow up with his whirlwind attack, but he almost never does the stationary version except on very rare occasions. The final boss in comparison to Mesmer is actually so much more poorly designed that it's almost embarrassing. Spoilers for the final boss, but Promised Consort Radon is a worse fight than base game Radon. What I mean by that is simply this. If you design a move that has no counterplay besides run away or block, that is a terribly designed move. The same is true in the opposite direction. If you design a move that can only be rolled that is a terribly designed move. Thankfully, there aren't many moves like that because a lot of grab attacks you can just outstrafe. The ones you can't, I think, are terribly designed. Promised Consort Radon has too many moves that require you to run away. His pull into Vortex in Phase 1 and 2, his opening attack in Phase 2, and pretty much every move where he sends out projections of himself you have to run away from and you also have to strafe left for the entire fight to avoid his Pillars of Light in Phase 2 and to avoid his Frame Trap attack. For anyone who doesn't know what a Frame Trap is, it's essentially when a boss or enemy does an attack that hits after the iframes from your roll end, but before you're able to roll again. That's a Frame Trap. Radon has a 3-hit combo where if you dodge the first attack, you will get hit by the second attack every time unless you are positioned under and to the left of the second swing, which is why you have to strafe left, because the first swing is from his left hand and the second from his right, so you want to strafe left so you can avoid the second hit. If the move didn't have any tracking at all, it would probably be fine to stay in front of him and roll to the left if you're at light load for maximum roll distance, but it does have tracking, so strafing left is required, unless you plan on blocking. Also, the ending to the DLC felt really underwhelming, so you don't even get the satisfaction of a good ending boss fight or cutscene, and honestly it just made me feel bad, because it's like, yay, we killed the one demigod who seemed to actually want to make a change for the good, even going so far as to sacrifice everything to do so, and we kill him for it. It doesn't make you feel like the good guy. In Dark Souls 3, the world is at its end and is really bleak, but there's at least some hope for a better world. But for Shadow of the Erdtree, you just get a memory of Mikola really just wanting to do good. It's not a ploy or an act to gain power. If it was, he would have said, I want to be a god instead of I'm going to be a god, because when he says I'm going to be a god, it's said in a way that makes it seem like he doesn't want to be a god, but he's resigned himself to do it, and wants to do it for the good. He was really just that guy, and we killed him. Maybe I just didn't pay attention, but I really don't get what the message is supposed to be. But 
Anyway, that's going to do it for me.